The year is 2001. Nikki McCown is a 28-year-old woman living in Richmond, Indiana. Nikki comes from a large family. In total, she has nine brothers and sisters. But out of all the McCown children, she seems to stand out the most. Nikki is known for her outgoing personality and ambitious attitude towards life. Utilizing a great work ethic, Nikki goes full force towards anything she wants. She strongly desires to do her part in making the world a better place. And with a strong interest in the justice system, she hopes to one day join the FBI or the U.S. Marshals. Those close to Nikki McCown say that the only thing bigger than her dreams is her personality. Nikki is described as extremely charismatic with a very welcoming nature. She could make friends with almost anybody. In addition to this, she's a doting mother to her nine-year-old daughter, Peyton. Though Nikki was only 19 when Peyton was born, she's done a great job as a mother. She and Peyton's father ended their relationship long ago, but they remain good friends and do well when it comes to co-parenting. While Peyton is certainly the apple of Nikki's eye, there's one more very special person in her life. Nikki is engaged to a man named Bobby Webster. The two had known each other in high school, but never actually dated. Bobby left Richmond after he graduated, but returned to the city in 1998. That same year, he and Nikki reconnected and began a relationship. By 2001, they've been together for four years. They share a home and are each doing well in their careers. Nikki, in particular, works as a prison accounting clerk in nearby Dayton, Ohio. At night, she takes criminal justice courses at Sinclair Community College. To those who knew Nikki, it was clear that her life was on the right path. July 22nd, 2001 was a Sunday. With Nikki and Bobby's wedding just one week out, they were just about ready for the big day. The two spent most of that morning completing household chores, but around noon, they went their separate ways. Bobby headed to pick up his cousin so the two could get fitted for their tuxedos. Meanwhile, Nikki decides to head to a local laundromat to wash clothes. Since Nikki had a bit of a heavy load, she and Peyton took Bobby's GMC SUV while he went off in her vehicle. On her way to the laundromat, Nikki stops at her mother's house to drop off Peyton. She then heads to the Coin Laundry located on Richmond's East Main Street. Barbara McCown, Nikki's mother, claims that her daughter was gone for about 30 minutes, but then returned to the house. She said that Nikki seemed very agitated when she got back. When Barbara asked what the problem was, Nikki explained that a group of men had been harassing her at the laundromat. Although she didn't go into detail, it was clear that whatever happened had made Nikki quite upset. Barbara had a washer and dryer in her basement. She told Nikki she could just bring her clothes back there and finish the wash. Nikki thanked her mother, but turned down the offer. Instead, she opted to return to the coin laundry and finish her clothes there. Nikki kissed her mother goodbye and told her she'd be right back. Around four o'clock that afternoon, Bobby, Nikki's fiance, arrived back home. He expected to find Nikki waiting for him. Instead, he found an empty house. At first, this didn't strike Bobby as odd. He assumed Nikki had gotten held up with errands and was running behind. But by 6.30, he still hadn't heard from his fiancée. That's when a bit of concern began to set in. Bobby's first call was to Nikki's mother, Barbara. She explained that Nikki was there earlier, but had left to head back to the coin laundry. Since then, she hadn't seen her. Bobby would end up phoning a few of Nikki's friends, but they also hadn't heard from her. Though he was starting to worry, Bobby chose not to jump to conclusions. He thought, maybe Nikki just got called into work. This wouldn't have been unusual, and at the time, no other explanation was logical. But when the clock struck 11 p.m., Nikki McCown was still MIA. By now, her family was convinced that something was wrong. They made a call to police, but were told they needed to wait an additional day before filing a report. In the meantime, Bobby and members of the McCown family began their own search for Nikki. 
They called around the local hospitals and drove through Richmond looking for the car Nikki had been driving. They even went out to her job to see if she was there. Despite these efforts, there was no sign of Nikki. The following day, the McCowns were finally able to report Nikki missing, but much to their dismay, police were not quick to take action. Once authorities caught wind of Nikki's upcoming wedding, they suspected that she left on her own due to cold feet. Of course, Bobby and the McCowns objected this idea. For them, even if Nikki did want to disappear, she'd never leave her daughter behind. All in all, the theory just didn't make sense. Though Richmond police did conduct an aerial search for the GMC, this turned up nothing. With no signs of a crime or foul play, authorities began looking at those closest to Nikki for answers. The first person they set their focus on was Nikki's fiance, Bobby Webster. And from what I could find, they had good reason to do so. In the days following Nikki's disappearance, Bobby made several suspicious moves that even caused the McCown family to raise an eyebrow. First, Bobby returned both he and Nikki's wedding rings and attempted to collect a refund. He also called the wedding venue and canceled their event. Lastly, Bobby reached out to Nikki's college and inquired about collecting her tuition money. This attempt was unsuccessful, and according to school employees, Bobby became very upset when he heard that there was no tuition money to collect. Bobby had a very different account of these events when questioned. He claimed that he never called to cancel the plans at the wedding venue, and the only reason he returned the rings and inquired about Nikki's tuition was so that he could gather reward money for information on Nikki. Eventually, Bobby was asked to take a polygraph test, and he agreed to do so. The results of the test did show deception on his part, but he claims this was due to confusion over the questions. In the end, police felt they had no real evidence to classify him as a suspect. He would, however, remain a person of interest in the case. The next few months would see no progress in the investigation. The McCown family remained shrouded in mystery as detectives tried to make do with what little they had. Then, on November 3rd, 2001, Richmond police received a call that the GMC had been found. The vehicle had been discovered in a Dayton, Ohio apartment complex. Oddly enough, this was the same apartment complex where Steve Johnston lived. Steve was Nikki's former boyfriend and the father of her daughter, Peyton. As you could imagine, this put Steve in the crosshairs of investigators, but he was adamant that he had nothing to do with Nikki's disappearance. Just like Bobby, Steve was asked to complete a polygraph test at the police station. He did so with no hesitation and passed with flying colors. Steve even provided a DNA sample and fingerprints for investigators. He was extremely cooperative and really did seem concerned for Nikki's well-being. With this, police felt comfortable ruling him out as a suspect. A subsequent search of the GMC would turn up no helpful evidence, but police would soon discover that Steve Johnston was not the only person in that area that knew Nikki McCown. Tommy Swint was a co-worker of Nikki's. The two had a friendship outside of work but it's said that Tommy had romantic feelings for Nikki. According to friends and family, these feelings were not reciprocated. At the time, Tommy Swint lived less than a mile from the complex where the GMC had been found, and there was at least one event that made police turn their attention towards him. One afternoon, Nikki's sister had stopped by to see her. She said that she could hear yelling from outside the door. Upon entering the apartment, she saw Nikki cowering on the couch as Tommy Swint stood over her. Nikki would later tell her sister that she believed Tommy was trying to rape her. Naturally, police really wanted to speak with Tommy Swint. Unfortunately, he refused to come to the station. And though he would later provide a DNA sample to police, this is as far as his cooperation went. With no solid evidence to connect him with the crime, police really had nothing on Tommy Swint. But years later, he would face the music in a completely different case. 
In 2010, DNA evidence connected Tommy Swint with the 1991 murder of Tina Marie Ivory. For years, the case had been ice cold, but when Tommy provided his DNA to police, he unknowingly sealed his fate. That same sample would ultimately tie him to Tina's murder. On February 3rd, 2010, a grand jury returned an indictment against Tommy for the crime. But in the end, the Ivory family would never get the justice they deserved. That same afternoon, Tommy Swint committed suicide. Any knowledge he may have had on Nikki's disappearance was now gone forever. It's been 21 years since Nikki McCown went missing. And after the passing of Tommy Swint, there were no additional suspects or developments in the case. Nikki's daughter Peyton is now older than her mother was when she disappeared. This story is a mystery in every sense of the word. Here was a beautiful young woman with a bright future ahead of her. If you ask me, she had no reason to disappear on her own, which only leads back to the same question. What happened to Nikki McCown? After all these years, family and loved ones continue their fight to find answers in the case. Let's pray that one day they get the closure they deserve. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you found this story interesting, click here to check out another case.